Welcome back, everybody. This is the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine video blog, video update, video podcast, whatever we want to call it, for April 22nd, 2014. Uh, this is the podcast version of the web version of the print version of our magazine. Uh, the print version has been on the streets for a couple of months now, and we'll have another issue out at the end of May. So if you're interested in being in that issue, be sure to go to that page on our website. Uh, I've got a very fun and exciting day today on our podcast. We have with us uh, Dr. Louis Mel Madrona. The coyote himself is going to be joining us live. And we are also joined by Dr. Dan Wagner of Nutra Pharmacy here in the North Hills. And be sure to catch us on this podcast every Tuesday at 4 o'clock, not just with these two guys, but with a whole bunch of other interesting folks. Uh, you can find us on the YouTube, the YouTube bots and the Google Meisters and all those kinds of things. So um, we're also sponsored uh, this week by Fresh from the Farm Juices. Uh, it's a great new sponsor that we have. Uh, they're helping us out, uh, and we're going to help them out by giving them a little extra exposure. It's a great local uh, product. We'll talk more about that coming up. And uh, we want to first start with... Um, the calendar of what's going on in uh, Peaceburg, here in the Berg. Uh, the integrated medicine calendar is first up with a big open house this weekend with Dan Wagner. That's on Friday and Saturday, uh, 10 a.m. Uh, till 3 p.m. both days. Speakers and prizes and free stuff and free food. That's why I'll be there. Um, we'll talk with Dan Wagner more about that. And then also, of course, May 2nd and May 3rd next week, uh, Friday is the conference, keynote speaker, Louis Malmadrona, and just the biggest gathering of integrative medicine professionals, probably in Western Pennsylvania history, as long as there have been integrative medicine professionals. And then on uh, the third, we'll have Louis with us at St. Clair in export for an intimate retreat, uh, and he'll dive deeper into the coyote wisdom and the power of, uh, the power of telling your story to heal. Uh, then coming up on May 4th, we have Jacob Lieberman coming to town. He is also going to be uh, in this podcast. We recorded some things with him a few days ago, and we'll finish up the show with that. And then on June 20th is Pandit Rajmani Tiganant. He is also affectionately known as Pandachi. He'll be in town on June 20th. Uh, giving a talk on the Yoga Sutra. So it's a big calendar. Be sure to keep up to date on the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine and on our website and um, uh, Twitter and Facebook and all the social media stuff. So let's get right to our guests. Um, first up, we have um, Dr. Louis Melmadrona, and uh, he is currently in Augusta, Maine. He is a professional troublemaker and author. Uh, how are you doing today, Louis? I'm doing good. The and snow is mostly melted. <laughs> well, yesterday we had 80-degree uh, weather, and now it's back to 40 or something. I don't know what's going on. I think I was pelted with small frogs on my way in today. I'm not sure what's going on with the weather. We also have with us Dr. Dan Wagner. How are you doing today, Dan? Hi, Sven. Yeah. Nice to talk to you, and thanks for having me on today. Yeah, I'm always, uh, always a pleasure to have you both on. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about, Dan, your uh, open house coming up this weekend. Uh, tell us who's going to be there and uh, what kind of things you're going to be having. Well, yeah, we're excited. This is our 17th open house as we begin our 18th year in practice as Western Pennsylvania's only completely natural pharmacy. So we have eight outstanding speakers. These are all free seminars and lectures on Friday Myself at 10.30 will speak about heavy metals and pollutants and detoxification. Jamie Dorley will speak. We have Lynn Wagner, my wife, who will talk about essential oils of the summer. We have a gal from Nordic Natural talk about fish oil. We know Jeff and Cindy Berkowitz. They're great um, people here in Pittsburgh that do a lot of cooking, and they're going to come and talk about how to uh, clean up your gut. We have a great new guest, Dr. Carolyn Shannon Karasik. She has a new book out called Gluten-Free Eating. And we also have a, a new uh, gal, Samantha Mandelowitz. She's a life coach, and she's going to be talking about sugar. Now, this is Friday and Saturday from 10 to 3 this weekend. And we have many um, booths set up with um, 
people like Nutritional Frontiers and Nordic Natural will be here, doTERRA essential oils, lots of discounts, free advice, professionals, again, great organic food. So come on by. If you need more information, call 412-486-4588. Or, of course, look on the Internet at our website, www.nutrapharmacy.com. Remember, we spell pharmacy with an F, not with a PH, because we don't sell pharmaceuticals. N U T R I F A R M A C Y. And not only do you not sell pharmaceuticals, you have never, ever in the history of that uh, business ever sold cigarettes, I believe, or, or candy <laughs> or anything else. I believe. Well, that sounds great, Dan. I'm lo really looking forward to being there and uh, meeting some of the, the guests that are going to be there. I think we're going to get the Fresh from the Farm Juice guys there, too, as well. So that's going to be fun. Oh, great. So Lewis is going to be here on uh, the second and the third. Um, it's always great to catch up with you, Lewis. The last time we talked uh, on camera, I think, was in 2009. We recorded uh, some footage for a documentary. And you always have the most interesting things to say. And so I'm always uh, curious to see where, where, what in the world is Lewis up to this week. Uh, and uh, tell us what you're doing in Maine, first off. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm, a, I'm being the director of a geriatric medicine fellowship in, at um, Maine Dartmouth Family Medicine Residency. And um, so I do, I'm doing uh, full spectrum family medicine, including obstetrics and, and um, hospital work and um, inpatient consultations, outpatient consultations. So we, we have a grant to look at how to improve memory among people with um, cognitive impairment. And of course, exercise and diet are huge. Yeah, that's going to be my first question is what, uh, what kind of uh, processes or modalities or treatments are you using uh, in that study? Sure. We're trying to get people to put walnuts in their M and M's. <laughs> yeah, one step at a time. <laughs> it's little steps. Yeah. You know what? I can remember when you never know what's going to come out of your mouth. I remember when we did that interview, and I said, "When? When is this going to change? With all the science that's behind nutrition now, with all the science behind all these great modalities." How fast is what you know? Is this going to change? You remember what your reply was? Probably one funeral at a time. Exactly, <laughs> exactly one funeral at a time. I didn't invent that. It was Max Planck <laughs> who said that in response uh, to a question of how fast does science change, and he said one funeral at a time. Well, you're a great researcher and an analysis of research. What has really struck you in the last year as being an important thing to be talking about in, in the public health? Well, I think that um, I'm most impressed with the effectiveness of being active, of, of getting out and walking biking, jogging, um, you know, getting off your butt at least a half an hour a day. There's a, there's a wonderful video by a Toronto, University of Toronto physician called 23 and a half hours. And he asks if you can commit to only being sedentary for 23 and a half hours a day. <laughs> so, um, so I think I'm most impressed with exercise as medicine. And, um, you know, if we had to go for one intervention that had the most benefit, I think it would probably be exercise. Um, you know, I, I still, I'm still focused on the power of the mind, you know, to change our brain. And, and therefore our body. Um, and we, we do a lot of that work, especially with, you know, we're especially interested in, in people with psychosis and in um, 
psychosocial approaches to psychosis. Hmm. We were we were just in um, Warsaw this last August for there was a there's a group called the International Society for the Psychosocial Therapies of Psychosis and and we discovered that there's now computer video games to interact with your voices, which seemed way cool. You know, that you can you can pick from a variety of avatars to represent your voice. And then the program works with you to get the right tone and to say what it says. And then um, the program then talks to you as your voice. You get to talk back to it, coached by, you know, any one of your choosing. So um, we don't have the program yet, but but we do some of that kind of work too. Wow, that is that is really amazing. I'd like to get more into that, but before we get off the topic of exercise, I want to be clear too. Now, there's a lot of talk about um, the infrared saunas and the importance of sweating every day which I would think would be a part of the moving every day. But um, it, you're saying specifically get off the couch. Don't just sit in, an, in a sauna and sweat. Get off the couch and actually move. And there's benefits from the movement and perhaps weight-bearing exercise and that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and apparently you get, you get more benefit if you can get your heart rate up um, in the – 60 to 80 percent range of maximal but you know you still get an amazing amount of benefit with just a brisk walk hmm. so um you know there are those of us who work out every day and sweat a lot but um not everyone wants to join us but i'm still really impressed with you know what percent of the benefit of exercise people can get without um, too much of the effort. It is really there, is a worthwhile activity. Is there a particular time of the day? Has it been shown to be more beneficial in the morning or in the, in the afternoon? It's most beneficial at the time that you'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> a true coyote answer there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think... Remember in Pittsburgh when I was there that they had, uh, in Liberty, uh, the, the area called Liberty. East Liberty. There was a, a program for ministers to walk with their flock at noon. Mm. And it was really successful in lowering blood pressure. Hmm. Well, I... I don't know what happened to that program, but... Yeah, I didn't hear, I've that never was, heard of that one. Pittsburgh was doing ahead of its time. So let's get back to uh, the power of the mind. Uh, your last couple of books have dealt with the issue of narrative medicine, which, uh, you know, when I describe it to people, I say it's the it's what you have learned on a scientific basis uh, from doing research about the power of storytelling or telling your own story, particularly to someone who will actually listen, which I know is a commodity that's in fairly short supply in American medicine. Um, talk to us more about exactly what narrative medicine is and uh, what you've discovered about its use and how you use it in your situation there. Well, you know, Rita Sharon, who, who wrote the first book with the title Narrative Medicine, Says, says that narrative medicine is the practice of medicine that's informed by narrative competency, which is sort of a um, tail around the dog definition. But what we mean by narrative competency is, is to understand that all memory exists in the form of a story. And that... Um, that we, when we interact, we tell each other stories. And, and that's how we keep the other person's attention. And in medicine, we have something that Arthur Kleinman called the illness narrative. And, and we all have a story 
about how we got sick, why we're sick, and we also have a healing narrative, which is what we think will make us better. And we doctors think that the only illness narratives that are true are the ones that we make up, and the only healing narratives that will work are the ones that we write down. But actually, I think that, um, you know, when you work within people's own stories about their illness and you try things that they believe in, often you get astounding results. And so, um, you know, that's really what the placebo effect is all about is I do something, I form a good relationship with you and I, we do something together that you really believe in and you really expect is going to help you. And, you know, to the extent that we can surround ourselves with a community of believers, we'll have even more powerful effects. Hmm. And to the extent that we actually have a treatment that does something biologically active, well, that's probably even better. <laughs> but, um, but I think for millennia, you know, people have been getting well without the kinds of biologically active treatments that pharmaceutical companies are, are promoting. They've been getting better through spiritual interventions or through herbal medicine, through the power of belief and expectation, through the power of relationship, um, through their own thoughts, you know, through love. And, um, you know, that's the essence of, of healing. It's the essence of the doctor-patient relationship. So narrative medicine is, merit is medicine that respects that. Mm. It says that we've all got a story. We've all got multiple all right, stories. Ready? We're all operating within those stories. Um, I'm trying to get you to play a role in my story. You're trying to get me to play a role in your story. Maybe you want me to play doctor in your story and I want you to play patient in mine. So how are we going to work together to, to create a story that works for both of us? Yeah. And how, how will I have to change my behavior to be a good doctor in your story? And how will you have to change your behavior to be a good patient in my story? <coughs> you know, and, and yeah. can we do that? You know, can we form a bridge? You know, that, in a, across which we can tell stories to to shape each other, you know, to to change each other, you know, to make each other healthier. So, for me, that's narrative medicine in a nutshell. Hmm. You uh, in the past we had talked, and you had talked about how uh, modern doctors like a linear trajectory. They like, you know, one cause uh, of, of a problem and one solution and one effect. And what you've just described, obviously, is something that's much more holistic, that there's many different forces at work all the time from many different directions. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how you, what, how have you been able to train or teach any other doctors and professionals that medicine is maybe works better in a nonlinear fashion than in a linear fashion. Well, <clears throat> you know, I I I think that once you've been in practice for five years, if if you're not hiding in the sand, you're starting to figure this out, and and so. Um, some of us figure it out earlier than others. You know, um, I, I figured it out in, in medical school when I was doing, um, I did a continuity clinic where I saw patients in one half day a week for two years in the, in the general medical clinic at Stanford. And I figured out that the drugs didn't work all that well. Now, of course, that was... 1973 and 74, so 
you could argue that we have better drugs now, but they still don't seem to work all that great. And I mean, with a couple exceptions, but, but look at psychiatry where the drugs are right. dismal. Right. Um, so it doesn't take a long time to figure out that, well, this isn't quite working. I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I, I saw someone today, you know, whose doctor had diagnosed her with, with bipolar, you know, and, and so I wanted to know, well, so what is, what is it that makes your doctor think you have the bipolar? And it turned out that, you know, it started when her grandfather died and she um, broke down and sobbed for 15 minutes. And I said, and what had happened? She said, they called the doctor and the doctor came over and, and gave me a pill and, and um, told me I had the bipolar. She and, had and I said, well, then what happened? She said, well, I took the pill for a couple years and then my other grandfather died and I had another breakdown. And I said, well, same kind of breakdown. You, you sobbed on the couch for 15 minutes and then it was over and, and you felt fine? She said, yeah, same kind. I said, well, what happened? She said, my doctor changed my medicine and said it wasn't working. And, and, um, and then she did fine until uh, for a variety of apparently political reasons because, you know, she'd been for all intents and purposes doing fine in her job. Um, she got fired. And then she started, you know, crying on a daily basis. And then her doctor added a new drug. And, and um, that drug seemed to have impaired her memory. Mm. And that's how she got to me. Oh. But, but really the, the most remarkable part of this story is that no one ever offered her any counseling. Mm. Nobody ever thought to teach her, you know, that it's actually normal to have emotions. Yeah. That if that if someone who's who's near and dear to you dies, that fifteen minutes of sobbing might be normal. And that you might not need a drug for every feeling. And and so, you know, from the doctor's point of view, she's got the bipolar and the doctor's having trouble finding the right medication. You know, from our point of view, you know, being more holistic, we might say that, that, you know, she's living a life in which she hasn't really learned to manage a full range of emotions. Right. And she could use a little guidance and instruction. And, and you know, probably she should eat more vegetables and exercise. And exercise, yeah. <clears throat> Well, while we have you here on the podcast, uh, Dan, do you have any questions uh, for Lewis? Oops, Dan's still there? Dan, you still there? Can he hear me all right? I can't hear me. He might. He might. Wait. Yeah, you're there. Um, I don't know. He might. Hey, Dan, are you still with us? He's messaging me. I lost the audio on my end. Oh, okay. Dan lost uh, the audio. Oh, darn. Okay. Um, we'll, I don't well, know. Okay. We'll just soldier on here, and you want to try to get him back up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll see what I can do here. Okay. Um, you bring up so many interesting points, Lewis. Uh, you know, I work with a, a psychiatrist out there in uh, Export here uh, that's sponsoring the conference, Dr. Softar Chaudhry, and he has based his entire practice now on mindfulness and bringing people to a state of being here now as the very first step, as the foundation towards uh, building, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, you build your other alternatives from there. It's easier to get somebody to walk or eat their broccoli uh, if they can first just be here now and be in the present moment. 
Um, have you incorporated any of that kind of uh, attitude or aspects sure. of that into your healing? Yeah, I mean, you know, change is, is about learning to control our attention, I think. Where, where do we direct our attention? And, and the more that you can control your attention, you know, the better, the, the, the better off you are, of course. And, and um, I think the challenge, so many of our patients simply won't make the effort. And um, so this week I, I've tried with one patient, I proposed, you know, her problem was that she overeats in the face of stress and, and uh, everything is stressful for her. <laughs> so she's gaining weight. And, and I proposed that she do deep breathing before we, you know, we negotiated that she would do two minutes of slow deep breathing and, and imagining that she loved herself as much as she loves her dog. Mm. Two minutes. And then she would eat. And, and so that, that's the kind of centering. Yeah. I'm not going to get her to go sign up for a mindfulness meditation class. Yeah. But, um, but that's a start. And with another guy, I proposed the challenge, which he accepted, and I'll find out tomorrow if he did it, that he'd take a half an hour walk each day in which he notices three things that he hadn't ever noticed before. Hmm. And, and so that's another attempt at inducing a bit more mindfulness. A little more awareness. Of their... We'll see if he did it. I've noticed you use, yeah. you've used the, uh, the phrase challenge when you talk about what you do with your patients. That's an interesting word to use. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard a doctor use that word challenge uh, as in the, describing their interactions before. How does that work? Do you find that useful? Well, I find it useful to, to um, raise the question with people. So what are you really willing to do to improve your condition? I remember one woman... She said, anything. And I said, okay, how about Qigong? She said, not that. <laughs> and I said, okay, so not anything. So what, what things are you willing to do? And she said, well, what I meant was I'll take any pill you'll give me. Uh, and I said, oh, yeah. so you're not really willing to do, you know, mindfulness meditation or yoga or physical therapy. She said, well, of course not. <laughs> of course not. Right, of course not. <clears throat> and, and so when, you know, so when I, it, when I think of, of challenging someone, I think of calling them to their commitment. So if, if, if you say to me that you'll do anything for half an hour, then I'm going to challenge you to do something for half an hour. And if it turns out that you can't do it, well, that's okay. You can come back. No big deal. But, but, uh, but if, if that's your commitment, then, you know, it's my, my role is to witness your commitment, mm -hmm. is to be the one to whom you're accountable. And, and naturally, I'd like to share that, you know, with the rest of your community. Oh, sure. It's not just me that you're being accountable to. But, um, you know, sometimes that's the only beginning people can do is to be accountable. Um, it, it seems to break them out of know, that cycle. Today I had a guy, I'm sorry. Go yeah. Ahead. No, it, I was just saying, today I had a guy admit to me that he, he quit smoking um, five years ago. But don't tell his wife he still smokes a cigar every day. <laughs> and I said, well, as long as you do it outside and don't inhale it, you know, I'm not going to get on your case. You need a little 
you need a little vice. You know? Well, I, so, I'll take that as doctor's orders that we need a little vice in our in our life every day. I well, that's good you know, advice too. I'll tell you an interesting study. It was a big study from the UK of government employees, and it was looking at the effect of alcohol on memory. And it turns out that the worst effect was people who drank nothing. Hmm. So people who go. abstained <laughs> had the most effect on memory. <laughs> I, I'll, so, I'll go for that. Yeah. So maybe we need a little vice, you know? Yeah. I, yeah. Today, maybe not everything that, that someone thinks is bad is bad for us. And, and I think that gets back to the story. We need, we need a story about what is a good life? Hmm. What is a healthy life? And, and if I feel happy, that goes a lot further than if I'm doing all kinds of things that are supposed to be healthy, but I'm suffering in the doing of them. Right. You know, I'm right. not enjoying myself. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's a lot to say for feeling happy. You know, feeling content, feeling like, wow, I've got a good life. This is really great. And, and um, you know, I think we should strive toward happiness. <laughs> I think that's a there's, good There's at least option. two countries that have a, what is it, Bhutan? Right, Bhutan. have departments of happiness. Well, they have a, uh, I think they have a domestic, happiness. domestic happiness uh, meter. Like we have a gross domestic product. They have a gross happiness product or, or something like that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. We you know, if we were if we were happier we'd spend a lot less on healthcare. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well on this uh, on this program, Lewis, we like to try to um, get as much factual information out there as we can. And I like to bring up things that I see in the news and uh, on social media and things that are being passed around as fact. And I like to get the opinions of some experts, if I can, on whether these are fact or not. So we have a new segment that I'm actually calling the Whiskey Tango Foxtrot Over, which is military speak for uh, basically, huh? Uh, which means, what? what is this? So we have uh, something that's going around on social media that says microwaved water can kill plants. And apparently, according to this uh, post that's been on Facebook and a bunch of other places, uh, if you boil water and then let it cool, or if you microwave water and then let it cool, and feed those two different waters to two different plants, one plant will die, and the other plant will be fine. Um, I immediately went to Snopes.com, and uh, yeah, we, we're showing the right now the uh, the, the pictures of the plant, uh, the one plant as it slowly dies. I went to Snopes.com. They said they could not reproduce it. They gave it a big fat false me, uh, on it. Uh, what's your take on that, Lewis? Do you have any knowledge or any science or research done on microwave water and its effects on the body? You know, I, I don't, but I, I, you could easily do the experiment with some eighth graders. You could get exactly. them, you know, you could take some soil and make it adverse, you know, and put some put some seeds in it, uh -huh. and pour the microwaved water on it, and pour the sp pour spring water on it, you know, and you could you could have a bunch of batches so that you get you could do it with a bunch of eighth grade classes across Pittsburgh. I think we should try to organize that. Yeah. Yeah, you could easily get statistical significance. Yeah. So and obviously. You find out. You're uh, you're walking right now. We're we're having a good view of your Adam's apple right this second. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I wanted to check. Mike is uh, Dan. Did Dan get back in? Uh, just just about, I think. He what? Working on it. Still He's working still on working it. on it. Okay. Um, well, that was one question I had that was in the news today. Uh, the other question that was in the news that I think probably is a little more valid. Uh, the the Physicians Council for Responsible Medicine has just come out with a new statement that says that the paleo diet uh, can actually worsen cholesterol. What's your What's your take on the paleo diet, Lewis? Well, you know, um, I have to say that I'm fairly, I'm reasonably enthusiastic about it. Um, 
you know, I think that my own experience, I, I haven't done a study on it, but my own experience is that when I've, when I've gotten people to do it, and, and I would say it's a, it's, you know, it's a largely vegetable diet because, you know, cave people had, they didn't, they had to really work hard for their meat. Right. You know, so, so they, you know, the meat wasn't the 80% of the diet. It was more like 20%. And there's a lot of so exercise in that. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. So a modified paleo diet, I've seen people drop their cholesterol dramatically. You know, I think probably grains contribute a lot to cholesterol. Ah, okay, Dan, uh, you're back on now. Did you have any questions uh, for Dr. Lewis? Yeah, I'm back on now. Oh, great. Okay, hi, Lewis. Hi there. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we were disconnected. Good. Yeah. Well, you know, we all hear a lot about diets. I read, like you said earlier, about um, you know, sort of connecting with. Um, Oh, I don't know. Sometimes I call it holistic, but I call it ancient healing. You know, I travel quite a bit to the rainforest. And when we talk about people who have maybe more experience and feelings and intuition with an education, we might learn a little bit more. I remember the great uh, shaman from Belize, Elikio Panti. And he would always say when we come down, he goes, you know, the problem with you uh, college students and PhDs and doctors is you think too much. We don't feel, you know, and I get, I think that five years you said about really getting to know your practice really comes into um, fruition when you sort of have that intuition and general feelings about, you know, what your patients. Sometimes you know what their problem is even before you start to talk to them. Um, as far as the dietary thing, I hear a lot about diets. I don't promote any one diet. I think to think that all people fit the same diet just is crazy. It just doesn't work. But if I had to say what's the best middle-of-the-road diet for Americans, I would probably say it's the Mediterranean diet because it's, it seems that's, that the that's people in the, the Middle East evidence. and I mean, Italy and Greece have less evidence. cholesterol, okay. obesity, and of course they walk into the marketplace a little bit more. Hey, Dan, let's let uh, Lewis had a comment on that. Go ahead, Lewis. <laughs> well, no, I was just saying that the Mediterranean diet is the best supported by the evidence. And I, but I think that if you look at that diet, it's also a relatively low grain diet. I don't know if anybody's seen David Perlmutter's new book, Grain Brain. You know, I, I haven't read it yet, and I don't know if he overstates the case, but his his belief is that grain is bad for our brain. Hmm. And And I certainly, you know, it seems to me that grain tends to be pro-inflammatory, much more so than vegetables. You know, and, and, true. and I, I think that we probably um, push grain because it's cheap. <laughs> you know, and, and um, we probably have too much of it in storehouses. Whereas vegetables are expensive. You know, if you go to the store, um, a loaf of bread is a lot cheaper than organic vegetables. So, um, but I, you know, clearly we need to do more work on studying diet. Food is medicine, as Hippocrates said. Right, right. Well, I really appreciate uh, both of you being with us today. Um, we've used up uh, a lot of our hour here. I uh, just wanted to get your take on one more thing. We have a great new sponsor uh, this week, the Fresh from the Farm Juices. And these are cold pressed and uh, then they're put through a process called HPP, I believe it is, which is a high pressure packing, which means that it gives them uh, a, a longer shelf life, several days, and uh, keeps all the enzymes and things. Lewis, uh, you first, you've talked a lot about uh, juicing and cleansing. Uh, we talked about the subject in the past. What's your, um, what's your take on uh, juices and do you give juices now to your uh, patients there where you are? Well, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, <clears throat> you know, a vegetable juice fast is really valuable. And especially in figuring out, you know, what kind of food allergies people have. And, I mean, a lot of juices, I, I would prefer people avoid them because of the sugar surge, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I think, I think 
fruit works better than juice because of the fiber prevents some of the sugar surge. Okay. But, um, you know, if you, if you, I do have patients that the only way I can get them to eat, you know, decent protein is to blend it up as a powder and mango juice. <laughs> and so, you know, I think it, you start with where someone is and, and you see where you can take them. Yeah. And, and, you know, yeah, Dan, Dan, what's your what's your take on juicing and uh, detoxing? You're asking me or Dan? Oh, no, I'm sorry. This That's is for Dan. Probably the most yeah. effective. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I think it's the most effective way, a natural way to detox is juicing. I mentioned that earlier in one of my uh, programs. You know, we we think that. Food is medicine, and I agree with that, but I think we all know people in our life, you know, guys who live to be 95, and they ate all the fat, and they rarely ate uh, vegetables, and they smoked a cigar and drank a little too much alcohol. They say, well, you know, the old joke is just, and they died at 95, and the old joke is just think how long they would have lived if they were vegetarians. <laughs> but, you know, I think we have to forget, we forget sometimes the happiness factor. These people who are just, uh, have a joy of life, and have less stress because they really are happy people and they really have anxiety and tension and fear. And these people live longer. There's little doubt about that. So we do think diet's an important aspect of it, but just to think eating healthy is going to uh, get us to a good old age, I'm just not sure I believe that. I think it's multifaceted. I think it's holistic, and holistic is not a new age term. It just means whole. And, uh, you know, Lewis is an MD, so he knows there are some drugs out there that work quite well, even though we're certainly an over-drug society. Mm -hmm. Supplements become important because I don't think you can get all your nutrients from the American diet. But, of course, what we eat every day is important, stress management, heredity, a good night's sleep, and even spirituality and religion. And we say, well, what's the most important? Well, they're all important. If you think you're just going to find one to cure the cancer, well, good luck. But we think... Uh, from our approach, we like to look at this holistic approach and try to uh, see what's the most important for an individual, not for the practitioner all the time. Well, I just, uh, uh, here we have it. This is the news. Uh, two doctors have said the most important thing in life is to be happy. And I don't think I could uh, agree with that anymore. Uh, again, really appreciate both of you joining us today. Dr. Louis Malmadrona, any any last words you want to say about uh, what you're going to be talking about uh, in on uh, May second when you're here, Louis? I promise to tell a story about coyote <laughs> that, will, that will make you glad you came. Awesome, Dan. Any previews from you? Well, I'm going to show some slides uh, of some of my last 20 years to the rainforest and some of the indigenous students that I've taken, the fauna, the flora. So I'm not, I don't want people to look at the screen and just try to read notes, so we'll give them notes, but we'll talk a little bit about this pursuit of medicinal plants, sacred seeds, modern natural medicines, and really how, how many of the pharmaceuticals that we use today have come from natural sources. But we also want to talk about, you know, the non-pharmaceuticals that are really popular today that have come from rainforest and natural areas and how they really, you know, they really have a lot of positive healing effect and we need to sort of integrate this whole aspect of allopathic and what we call natural medicine. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these products that have come from Central America, South America, and Africa and how we utilize them in our practices today. And but still big business too, which is also important. Right. Sounds great. Can't wait to see everybody May 2nd at the uh, Blairsville and the Chestnut Ridge uh, Conference Center. Thanks again, Dr. Dan Wagner and Dr. Louis Melmadrono. Thank you. So uh, that, um, <laughs> I just can't get enough of those two guys. They, they are just uh, two of the most interesting people I know in integrated medicine. But um, the other night I had a great uh, opportunity to interview another person who I found ridiculously fascinating. Um, this is uh, Jacob Lieberman. He is also going to be coming to town that same weekend, May 4th, that's the Sunday, and he'll be showing up at the Schwartz Living Market on the south side. And uh, he lives on Maui, so um, a little bit of a time difference. It was bright daylight where he was, and it was the middle of the night, or <laughs> here in Pittsburgh. 
Um, and what I want to do now is go to a couple of segments um, that we have uh, put up on our website about him, uh, that my, from my interview with him, where he talks about light as medicine. That was one of his books, Light is the Future of Medicine, and how, what, what light's effect on the body and the difference between natural light and unnatural light. So let's take a listen to that. Talk a little bit about how, and I want to stay on this theme of light is consciousness. Talk a little bit about how <coughs> light comes into our, uh, through our eyes. I mean, this is how you started yeah. down this road. Comes through our eyes and then goes through the hypothalamus and the process from there. Because I found this, this is from your uh, TEDx Maui talk. I found this two minutes of that talk uh, just completely profound, and, and I want to try to tie that together with, on a very physical, third-dimensional reality level, how light affects the eye and, and what that process is like. Okay, so let's imagine that light, by the way, if you speak to any quantum physicist in the world and you say, what is the nature of reality? What's the bottom line? What's all this stuff made of? And they'll say to you, well, this stuff is made of non-stuff. <laughs> what do you mean non-stuff? Well, the non-stuff is energy. Really, what, what kind of energy? Well, the fundamental energy is light. Light is the foundational vibration from which everything erupts. Okay? That's very profound. So now, let's take it to the step you're at. Light interacts with the eyes. And by the way, light doesn't just come in, it also goes out. But we'll get to that later. Yeah, that's a whole different conversation. A whole different conversation. Yeah, yeah. So we know that light that goes into the eye basically catalyzes the process we know as vision. Most people are aware of that. Very few people are aware that most of the light entering the eye has nothing to do with vision. It serves a totally different function. It takes a separate pathway from the eye to a place in the hypothalamus. It's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The that's suprachiasmatic easy. nucleus... Did you say something? I said that's easy for you to say. Yeah. The suprachiasmatic nucleus is the site of the body's biological clock. What does that mean? That's the place in the brain that basically sets up the rhythm and timing of everything. How does it set it up? It sets it up. How does it know when to cue you to wake up, when to go to sleep, when to eat? For a woman, when she's going to menstruate. Well, it does that because light from Mother Nature enters the eye, goes to the site of the biological clock, and basically sets the clock so that the internal clock is in syntony, is in harmony with Mother Nature's clock so that the inside knows what the outside is doing. So that rather than uh, going to sleep uh, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, we're not waking up at 10 o'clock at night. So jet lag, for instance, occurs when you travel and you're out of the light, and the light hasn't reset your clock. Uh. The hypothalamus is called the brain's brain. It's yeah. considered like the CEO, the CEO yeah. of the brain because it directly regulates the autonomic nervous system, the endocrine system. It initiates our response. It, it, it initiates the stress response. And it is also the biggest collector of information having to do with our emotions and so on. So it's a very profound area of the brain. And light goes directly to the biological clock in that part of the brain. Simultaneously, light is also experienced by the pineal. The pineal gland or pineal organ, more appropriately called, has been historically referred to as the sphincter of thought, the seed of the soul, or the third eye. 
Well, you say, boy, those are strange names. Well, if you take the pineal out, you'll see that it actually resembles an eye. That's quite interesting. Uh, Descartes said it was the seat of the soul, the seat of consciousness. It's interesting that it's the part of the brain that's singular. It's not like the two hemispheres, the two sides of the brain. This is right in the center of the brain, and it exists as one, not two halves. The pineal is called the regulator of regulators. It is directly in touch with every other regular regulator in the body. And so when the pineal experiences light, and what it does is it receives information about light and darkness, <coughs> day and night, the Earth's electromagnetic field, and the quality of light in the environment, that information is shared with every cell in the body simultaneously. It's not a hierarchy where things are going one after the next. In linear or local consciousness, it's a non-local experience, which means it's happening like it does in the quantum world. Everything is aware of everything at the same time. And what that information does is it basically tells each cell, communicates to each cell the information it needs so that the cell can, can orchestrate its internal function in order to synchronize itself with Mother Nature so that we are always in a continual harmonious relationship with light. So light entering the eyes not only guides physical movement via vision and the learning that comes from that, but it guides our physiology so that we stay in balance with Mother Nature rather than going extinct <coughs> because we're out of touch with Mother Nature. When you recognize the relationship between light and consciousness, then there's a totally different level of profoundness there. And, you know, you spoke about food as medicine. Yeah. There's a reason that we are not born requiring medicines unless we're sick. But we do require food. And I can tell you that I have personally experimented with food on myself a variety of different ways and it produces a much more dramatic response for like chronic conditions. To give you an example, I, um, I've had a lot of joint injuries and my cholesterol has a tendency to be a little elevated. So a couple years ago I decided to try raw foods. Just wanted to see what it was about. 24, and I have a lot of arthritic joints. 24 hours into it, I noticed my body, my joints were feeling much better. Three days into it, I didn't have a pain in my body. And I was stretching like I couldn't even believe. I had just done a blood test before I began. Two weeks later, I went to my physician who is not a holistic physician, she's just a straight medical doctor, and I redid the whole blood panel. My total cholesterol and my LDL, the unhealthy cholesterol, were each 40 points less, 40 <laughs> points. And she said, what the hell did you do? I said, I've been eating raw food. She says, that's amazing. There is no drug that can act this quickly. That's right. That's right. So now there is a yeah. very dramatic example, and there are millions of them. And I'm not suggesting that food replaces medicines. What I'm suggesting is that rather than driving on the right side of the lane or on the left side of the lane, our job is to keep the car in the middle. We stay in the middle, we use the most natural, minimally intrusive techniques, 
and God forbid if you break a bone, thank God we have doctors that can serve that purpose. If you get an infection, thank God we have antibiotics. So this is not against physicians. This is, thank God we have physicians, and it would be beautiful, and physicians are beginning to get this, to recognize that food is a medicine. And eating, you know, a little over 90% of disease is chronic. About 8 to 9% is acute. Most acute illness is described as self-limiting, which means if you do nothing at all, it heals by itself. Mm. The other 91 to 92%, which is called chronic disease, the only thing that significantly affects the course of chronic disease is lifestyle change. Exactly. Lifestyle change has to do with what we are consuming, uh, how we're living, and so on. There is no one way of eating. If you go into the ocean, you'll see that there are fish that just eat vegetables, and there are fish that eat other fish. <laughs> you know, there are plants that uh, are just nourished from the soil and the rain, and then there's other plants like Venus flytraps that consume animals, right. flies, and so on. And that occurs in every aspect of nature, in, including human beings. So it's not about adopting something that sounds interesting. It's about finding what matches beautifully with your nature. If I try to take an American plug and put it into a British outlet, it won't work. I can force it, and I will distort it, but I won't get light out of it. Mm. I have to find that which naturally works for me. And in the process, you learn, you get an education, because when you're eating foods that resonate with you, you see all kinds of things that go on in your body that you think are normal, like, oh, I'm feeling a little bloated, or, you know, I notice that I eat, <coughs> and then I start getting this mucus discharge, or I wake up and my eyes are red. Right. When you begin to recognize what your body reacts to, and you eliminate that, your body starts to normalize, not only in terms of weight, but normalize in all of its functions, your blood sugar, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, all of these things begin to normalize. Well, it's, fine that, it's fine in that middle of the road, though, is like you say, you don't want to drop too far to the left, too far to the right, and, and finding that middle of the road is so different for everybody, and that's, that's what the challenge is, I think, in, in today's well, medicine. You we know, all, we all uh, want to find that, those silver bullets, and there really aren't that many silver bullets out there. Um, there may not be any. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, when you think of silver bullets, you see, when we create a medicine, um, regardless of where it's sourced from, we say we discovered the active ingredient. In other words, the rest of the stuff is really garbage. Whatever created this must have made a mistake. There's only one thing that's really valuable here. Such a ludicrous idea. It's, there is no active ingredient. There is an ingredient alongside many other ingredients that creates a balanced source. Why is that important? If I give you a food, unless you're allergic to it, you will eat that food and you will have an effect, but you will have no side effects. The moment I take out the active ingredient and I say, oh, this is what really causes it, and I give you that, I immediately create hordes of side effects hmm. because anything that is man-made, in other words, that is made from our mind that thinks it knows what's going on, 
that part of the brain, that part of the mind, its creations have effects and side effects, which means sooner or later they start causing a lot of problems. Whether you're talking about um, polluting the air, <coughs> climate change, GMOs, or any of these other good ideas. Even penicillin, even wonderful antibiotics were a great idea. But now we have all of these side effects, that, you know, uh, bugs that are resistant to all of these things. So we have to keep creating more potent kinds of things. Well, now let's look at the other aspect of creation. When nature creates, it doesn't create with side effects. It's created in like harmony, in, in a way that's harmonious with everything. So what I'm saying is it's nice that we have medicines, but when we recognize what you said, that food is medicine, and we can provide it in its natural source, not as apple juice, but as an apple, all of a sudden the effects are totally different and no side effects. When you talk about light and how it regulates our internal clock, are you specifically talking about sunlight or, I mean, that we don't get that same effect from fluorescent lights, is that correct? No, those will, those will if they're bright enough, they'll affect the clock also. Um, ah, okay. And, and, and to give you an example, um, you're how old? I'm 54. Okay. So when you were a kid um, and girls were 12 or 13 years old, they were just beginning to develop. Often today you see kids 10 and 11 years old that their physical uh, organ, you know, their, their, their size is like, it looks like hyperdevelopment. Right. Well, you know, light is so related to reproduction and so on that when we're sitting inside and when it gets dark rather than going to sleep we just turn the lights on inside. <clears throat> all of a sudden we're affecting all of our rhythm and cycles, all of our hormones, our, our entire development. I mean, you know, when you if I said to you a plant's life is regulated by light, you would say any fool knows that. And I said, well, what if we put the plant in the closet? You'd say, hey, it would probably wilt and die. Well, it's interesting. When we take prisoners and we put them in isolation, in seclusion, they start going batty. They lose all their sense. All of their physiology begins to go batty. Not only emotionally, but physiologically. So putting them in the hole was like um, you're torturing them. <coughs> Because you're not giving them any way of knowing is it day or night or whatever. So we respond to light in the same way plants do. If we're sitting in indoor lighting and not getting the benefits of natural sunlight, it's going to affect our health. Because the indoor light is not the same as the outdoor light. Yeah. If so we're inside too much, we're going to end up with all kinds of problems. And so you need a minimum daily requirement of light. You need to get outside of the light. As you know, winter time sets in probably in Pittsburgh, and there's a lot of people that get depressed. There's yeah. not enough light. Yeah. Yes? Well, that's just one of the aspects of it. But there's so many aspects that occur just because we're sitting in office buildings and places like that that often are windowless all day long. So, and so that's one problem of not getting enough light. The reverse is also true. You go up in a satellite, you look at Mother Earth, and you'll see that there's certain cities like Tokyo, New York City, London, it's never dark. Yeah. The lights are on around the clock. You go into the neighborhoods where the light is on all the time, 
and you see higher incidence of breast cancers and other kinds of things hmm. because at night when the light goes off the pineal secretes a very powerful hormone called melatonin yeah. and that has everything to do not only with regulating a lot of functions and making us feel sleepy at night but it also has a lot of anti-cancer effects and so on when the light is on all the time <coughs> the pineal doesn't secrete melatonin not only do we end up with sleeping problems but all kinds of other problems so now they're finding that you know you can have malillumination from not enough light or the wrong kind of light but you can also have light pollution from too much light <coughs> so it's a very profound area to to look at so thanks again for watching our podcast and thanks to our guests Dr. Louis Melmadrona, Dr. Dan Wagner and Dr. Jacob Lieberman um, they will all be here on the weekend of May 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. I hope you come out. I hope we can meet you. We're also uh, running a integrated medicine professionals meetup group, and uh, we'll have that up on our website. We'd like to meet you personally. This is a growing community of professionals, um, more than just people interested in their own health. This is doctors and journalists getting together and helping to educate the community about the latest science of what is really out there. So tune in to this podcast every Tuesday at 4 o'clock. You can watch it live and see how the sausage is being made. Or you can catch the podcast all week uh, on YouTube and hopefully soon on iTunes and on, what's the other one we're on, Mike? Spreaker, Spreaker which you have to be able to say Spreaker, uh, not to be confused with Beaker from the Muppets. So, um, or watch for us here on the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine.com. I'm Sven Hosford. Thank you very much for watching.